this um, project is um, uh, a bit uh, different from the papers presented previously in the sense that it's more of a basic uh, science exercise. Uh, it's uh, applicable, we think, but uh, it's still fairly basic in nature. So it's not designed for immediate application. If you fair value it, I would say it's applied. But at the moment, it's uh, kind of in early stages of exploration. And uh, what we're dealing here is a very basic uh, question, uh, which is uh, to what extent and how exactly cash flow risk is shaped by the properties of uh, firm's uh, costs. And uh, there is a very commonly used idea uh, in academic uh, work that uh, looks at uh, operating leverage that arises because of the cost uh, function that the firm has. And the assumption is that if you look at uh, profits being revenue minus costs, and I'm being kind of vague uh, about the exact details here, but if you think of costs as being sort of relatively fixed, then of course that's going to create a mechanical leverage effect, uh, making profits relatively risky for firms for which uh, costs are relatively high compared to the revenue. And uh, the benefit of this observation is that you could immediately generate a value effect in the cross-section of stock returns, um, not as an anomaly, but uh, as a risk-based effect, which uh, is going to tell you that uh, essentially firms with relatively low level of profitability are going to experience a stronger leverage effect from this channel, and uh, their cash flows are going to be relatively risky. Of course, these firms also will uh, trade at lower valuation ratios, so they're going to be our value firms. And so this argument tells you that operation leverage means that value firms are more risky. Now, the trouble with this uh, argument, which is also kind of understood, uh, is that uh, if you apply the same logic to sorting firms on profitability, then you see that uh, this operating leverage leads to a counterfactual implication that uh, less profitable firms should be the ones that are more risky, yet it's uh, more profitable firms that earn higher average returns. So it doesn't look like the same channel can be used to explain both the value premium and the profitability, profitability premium. And to reconcile them, we have to think uh, broader about the properties of firm costs. That's kind of one motivation. And uh, what we focus on in this paper is uh, this assumption that uh, costs are relatively fixed compared to revenue. Uh, firm costs, of course, uh, come in different shapes and uh, forms. And some of them can be modeled as relatively fixed or sticky, but some of them are pretty variable. And uh, what we find is that when you think about uh, many of the costs that firms face, they're very far from being fixed, and they come move a lot with the firm revenue. So if you think about uh, intermediate inputs in particular, and the uh, labor and services that are used to produce the finished goods, uh, these costs uh, are very far from being constant, and they're very variable. And that means that when you think about how they affect uh, the risk of firm cash flows, that effect is not really that of operating leverage, but it's more like operating hedge. Uh, these uh, costs, their variability, it lines up with the variability in uh, revenue in such a way that uh, it reduces the overall risk of cash flows to varying degree. And uh, what we explore here is how exactly the strength of this operating hedge relates to things like profitability measures and uh, how it shows up in um, cross-sectional sorts of firms that are used to construct uh, profitability factor in particular. So let's start with a couple of motivating observations. And then what uh, I will do is uh, lay out a modeling framework where we can think about what exactly may be happening in the production function of the firm and how to capture these effects formally in a structural model. So if you look at the aggregate data, so this is data from the BEA, uh, looking at um, time series properties of uh, gross output and uh, intermediate inputs, uh, what you see, first of all, is that uh, intermediate inputs, their value, and this is all adjusted for inflation, their value is uh, more volatile than that of uh, gross output. And uh, a second observation is that as a fraction of gross output, intermediate inputs are actually pretty non-trivial. So if you look at the aggregate data, you're getting something like 45% in terms of the time series average of this ratio. And uh, if you look uh, across the firms, if you use composite data, so that's a subset of the economy, then the median in the cross-section is even higher than that. It's about 67%. So what this is telling you is that relative to revenue, these intermediate costs are pretty high, which is not a surprise. And uh, at the same time, they're also quite volatile, at least in the aggregate. Uh, of course, uh, the aggregate numbers, they uh, diversify from specific shocks, and they look at the common shocks. But these are the things that are going to ultimately be priced uh, 
uh, as far as um, expected returns are concerned and the risk-based part of expected returns. So these numbers are suggestive that uh, modeling intermediate inputs as a fixed cost is uh, not a great idea, at least at the aggregate level. And the fact that they're more volatile than output potentially can make them a source of the operating hedge. And uh, here we look at this uh, issue more directly. We can estimate the elasticity of the value of intermediate inputs uh, with respect to uh, gross output. Now, first of all, these things are highly correlated with each other. The correlation is 92% of the annual frequency, so they can move quite a lot in a time series. And when you estimate the elasticity, what you find is that elasticity of the value of intermediate inputs, that's at the aggregate level, uh, is uh, higher than one. It's uh, 134 in our sample. Uh, so what this is telling us is that for each percentage increase in the value of the uh, output at the aggregate level, the intermediate input value rises by more than a percent. It's 1.34%. Uh, so that fact that elasticity here is higher than one makes the value of intermediate inputs a uh, hedge that ultimately reduces the risk of value added relative to the risk of the output. That has a promise when we're thinking about the implications for firm uh, level risk. But uh, these are kind of key motivating numbers that uh, value added is actually less risky, less volatile than a gross output because of the hedging component coming from the inputs. So this is where we're kind of diverging from the current literature where people are very quick to just kind of model these uh, firm costs as fixed. When in fact, when you look at the data, uh, there is a lot more nuance to that that uh, a big chunk of costs is very far from fixed. It's actually even more cyclical than revenue. Now, with this motivation, let me introduce a mathematical model, a structural model describing from production, and then we can discuss additional empirical facts in the context and the framework of this model. So this is going to help us organize our thoughts around this. So this is a static model. Uh, for simplicity. We're going to add dynamics down the road, but this is a static model of production. It's uh, very conventional. There is really nothing unusual here in terms of building blocks. So the firm here uses uh, two types of inputs. You have uh, capital input and you have uh, intermediate inputs, or we can use singular uh, intermediate input. Uh, we can uh, create a composite. Intermediate input uh, is denoted by E, capital is K, Capital here is going to be fixed for the purposes of the static model, so the firm doesn't adjust it during the single period. But intermediate inputs uh, can be adjusted by the firm, and they choose the level depending on how much production they want to do. Uh, intermediate inputs uh, can be bought at a market price uh, P, which is exogenous to the firm, but it's endogenous to economy in general. It's an aggregate object. Uh, firms take P as given. Uh, Firms are exposed to a profitability shock, X, and another profitability shock, Z. X is the aggregate profitability shock. This is the systematic part that's common to all the firms. And Z is the firm-specific part, which is idiosyncratic and diversifiable in the cross-section. And for simplicity here, we assume that all firms have the same loading on the aggregate shock. So we're not hardwiring heterogeneity and risk this way. We call X uh, profitability shock rather than uh, productivity shock, which is more common because we don't want to take a strong stand on what exactly is driving it. At the end of the day, both supply and demand channels are going to commingle. And when we're thinking about uh, the firm level results in particular, uh, supply shock, technological shock for one firm could uh, look like a demand shock for another firm, which is downstream in the production network. So essentially, X is a composite that captures both productivity and uh, demand shocks. And that, that is what uh, things like TFP actually measure. So now, this is our production function. And uh, the firm is going to optimize along one dimension. They're going to choose the level of input, E, to maximize current profits. It's a static model. So when we perform a firm maximization, we're going to figure out what the optimal level of output is going to be and what the corresponding uh, gross profits are going to be that the firm will generate. Now, I want to point out one uh, parameter here, eta, which controls the elasticity of substitution between the two inputs, capital and intermediate inputs. Uh, we don't know a priori what that parameter is, but uh, it's something that we can estimate uh, from the data. 
And uh, at the end of the day, what we will see is that intermediate inputs and the capital they are complements in the production function, which again is not surprising given our priors of how these various inputs are used jointly. So what we see on the slide is a partial result that tells us sensitivity or elasticity of firm's earnings, which is pi, with respect to the aggregate shock x, right? So that's uh, elasticity, it's a partial derivative. And uh, you don't need to worry about the terms and the formula. We're going to move to something that's more interpretable, but the point is that that elasticity depends on some of the parameters in the production function, including eta, and it depends importantly on uh, how the price of intermediate inputs varies uh, with the aggregate profitability shock. So now we're going to move further and we'll say, uh, let's uh, look at this elasticity of uh, firms' uh, profits with respect to the aggregate shock and see how that varies in the cross-section of firms. This elasticity is uh, a measure of fundamental risk of cash flows. Is it the same for all the firms? Is it heterogeneous in a way that we can relate to? It is heterogeneous, and in this simple model, there's only one dimension of heterogeneity among the firms, which is their idiosyncratic profitability shock. So what we see is that the risk of cash flows is a function of the idiosyncratic profitability shock. Now, what we are hoping to find is that it's an increasing function. So the more productive firms are more risky. So let's see under what conditions this model implies that in fact, more productive firms are the ones that have relatively high risk of cash flows. So that condition is a condition on this partial derivative. Basically as long as a derivative of the risk measure beta on the idiosyncratic productivity Z, idiosyncratic profitability Z is positive, we're going to find in this framework that more profitable firms are more risky. For that condition to hold, we need the following condition to be satisfied within the model. That a product of this elasticity parameter, eta minus one, times one minus the beta of the input prices on X, which is the property of the riskiness of input prices, that product has to be greater than zero. It turns out that this same condition, this very same condition, is necessary and sufficient for the relation between aggregate objects. Basically, if we want to find in this framework that um, value added when you aggregate across the firms is less risky than uh, gross output, the same condition has to be satisfied. So the point here is that as long as we're adopting this description of the firm production function, this empirical fact that we just looked at that at the aggregate level, value added is less risky than um, output, or that elasticity of value added with respect to output is less than one. That same condition is going to apply that at the firm level, we're going to see a profitability premium, that the more profitable firms are the ones with more risky cash flows. All right, so that's uh, one observation. So the, the empirical facts at the aggregate level are connected within this framework to the cross-sectional differences in risk at the firm level. Now, we are going to be looking for direct empirical evidence at the firm level as well, but this uh, is telling us this is motivating empirical fact is actually quite relevant for the cross-section of stock returns, even though it's coming from the time series at the aggregate level. So now let's look at some firm level evidence. Now we're moving from the BA numbers to Compistat, and we're going to be looking at a slightly different sample, of course. Now we're looking at the publicly traded firms and the somewhat shorter sample. So at the aggregate level, uh, we know that these uh, facts now, that um, uh, gross um, profit uh, is, um, growth is uh, more volatile uh, than, uh, um, so growth, profit growth is um, less volatile than uh, sales growth. So that there is a bit of a hedging going on. Now, elasticity of the aggregate uh, profit growth with respect to sales is uh, 75%. So what we are seeing is uh, this kind of evidence of the um, operating hedge at the aggregate level when we sum cash flows up across the firms. Now, these numbers are a little bit different from the previous ones because we're summing it up across a different set of firms, right? These are publicly traded firms as opposed to BA numbers that includes everything. So now, when we look at the firm level, we see actually the opposite picture, which could be a little bit confusing at first. So if you look at the firm level, it looks like profit uh, volatility is actually higher than volatility of sales. So if someone looks at these numbers, the conclusion will be that this operating uh, hedge 
so operating hedge uh, doesn't seem to be working, and the operating leverage mechanism that people are looking at actually is a pretty good kind of uh, qualitative description because it looks like profits are more risky uh, than sales. So if you do the elasticity of um, the growth in profits on the growth in sales, which you could estimate from the cross-section of firms in the panel, that elasticity is accordingly higher than one. So it looks like we're getting the opposite relation at the firm level. How could it be that at the firm level, profits are more risky and they have higher beta, than, beta higher than one on uh, sales, but once you aggregate, that relationship flips. What's going on? And uh, the key is that uh, we're really looking at slightly different objects here because uh, at the firm level, what matters a lot is idiosyncratic profitability shock that affects uh, firm sales. That does not correlate with the aggregate price of inputs. By definition, it's an idiosyncratic shock. But the common shock to firm uh, profitability, that does correlate with the aggregate price of input. And so the result is that this uh, hedging effect uh, is not really visible when you're looking at the firm because so much of the variability is coming from the idiosyncratic sources. But once you aggregate firms into a portfolio and you diversify idiosyncratic shocks, that systematic component becomes visible, and there you could see that there is actually an operating hedge happening as far as systematic shocks are concerned. But uh, when you think about idiosyncratic shocks, then uh, operating leverage effect seems to dominate. Of course, what we care about for pricing purposes is the systematic piece. So now, let's uh, dig deeper into the kind of empirical evidence to see to what extent this effect eventually translates into heterogeneity in risk. Uh, at the level of these uh, profitability sorted portfolios. So what you can do is um, uh, form portfolios on um, um, the ratio of uh, gross profitability to assets, like it's commonly done, and we're going to form five portfolios by sorting firms. And for each of these portfolios, we're going to estimate some of these uh, properties that capture a risk of both cash flows and returns. So here we're looking uh, at the properties of the cash flows of these portfolios. So if you look at the profits, at the gross profits of the, these portfolios, you see that there is a pattern that uh, for the low profitability portfolios, the volatility or rather the risk of um, these uh, gross profits is relatively low. So what these betas capture is the elasticity of the gross profit growth with respect to sales. It's a regression coefficient of gross profit growth on sales. And you see that that coefficient is a lot lower for the low profitability portfolio compared to the high profitability. So what this is telling us is that somehow for the low profitability portfolio, and our model basically suggests the explanation, it's the operating hedge, but for the low profitability portfolio, their profits actually are less risky than their sales. If uh, sales move by 1%, the profits move by 0.4% on average for that portfolio. Now, if you then look at uh, the components, if you look at the components uh, uh, like operating uh, profits, what you see is that once you go to operating profits, the level of risk rises, and uh, one would say, well, that's because there is some kind of operating leverage going on, and that's uh, probably what's driving this. So the the level of risk for all of these portfolios goes up relative to the gross profits because we're adding some other costs like SGNA. But that doesn't really change the pattern across these profitability portfolios. They basically all go up. So what this is telling us is that um, the beta of operating profits with respect to gross profits is higher than one. There is some kind of levering going on because of the component of cost that's relatively fixed. But that effect doesn't have a strong pattern in the cross-section of stocks, so it just lifts all bots and it just makes all of the cash flows more risky relative to these gross numbers. And so the bottom line is that when you then look at how operating profits slowed on sales, that uh, follows the same increasing pattern as we saw in the top line of the table, so that uh, operating profits of the highly profitable firms uh, look uh, a lot more risky than for the low profitable firms in relation to their own sales. So it tells you that this uh, operating hedging effect is uh, relatively strong for the low profitability firms and relatively weak for the high profitability firms. Now, intuitively, if you kind of uh, forget about the model for a second, uh, this is not that surprising because if you think about what, what is driving this operating hedge, uh, roughly speaking, it's that uh, costs, these input costs, 
respond more to the aggregate systematic shocks than revenue. And for the more profitable firms, these input costs are a smaller fraction of revenue. So this operating hedge effect is weaker. And it is more present, it is stronger for the less profitable firms. So that is the qualitative description of the mechanism. What we see in the data is the support of that. Of course, it's based on some implicit assumptions. But um, they seem to be borne out in the data. Now, let's uh, look at uh, some evidence on systematic risk in cash flows of um, basically these portfolios. And we want to understand to what extent these observations that we have seen so far uh, about the properties of portfolio cash flows eventually translate into heterogeneity and systematic uh, risk. So what we see here is the um, one, one type of exercise like that. We are going to use um, a utilization adjusted TFP growth as an aggregate variable that is a source of systematic risk that is relevant. And uh, we are going to look at things like gross profits and uh, cost of goods sold, um, and sales in relation to TFP growth at the aggregate level. And we want to see to what extent these uh, different variables uh, have uh, uh, different loadings on the aggregate TFP shocks. And uh, what we see is the following. If you look at uh, sales, this is the beta difference between high and low profitability portfolio. If you look at the beta difference of their sales, it's basically a statistical insignificance. So it doesn't look like more profitable firms have different risk of their sales as far as TFP shocks go. If you look at the cost of goods sold, same thing. There is not much of a difference there as well. It's also insignificant. If you look at the gross profit difference in the systematic risk with respect to TFP shocks, there you do see the difference. So what seems to be happening is that to the first approximation, sales risk is kind of flat across the portfolios. The risk of the input cost is kind of flat, but the composition of input costs versus revenue is very different. For the more profitable firms, uh, revenue is higher relative to the costs. And so this hedging effect shows up in uh, gross profit. It's not uh, driven by heterogeneity in sales risk. A related question would be, once we establish that there are these differences in cash flow profits, uh, in cash flow properties across the portfolios, why would we think that they would translate into expected return differences? Like what makes these uh, portfolios uh, differ in terms of the kind of risk that investors may care about? So here we get into the point where our existing body of knowledge is a little bit weak in the sense that we don't have universally accepted proxies for systematic risk that is priced. We have some variables that are commonly used and they have a lot of merit, but they're not really perfect and not very strong on the last. What we're gonna do is we're going to use uh, a couple of observations that are relatively intuitive and they're commonly used for this type of work. So we're going to look at uh, long-term consumption growth in the aggregate. Uh, we're also going to look at output growth, GDP growth, and we will see to what extent um, sorting uh, stocks on uh, profitability is going to generate heterogeneity in the exposures to those long-term economic growth. TFP shocks that we looked at before are also useful because they do predict long-term economic growth. So we have seen heterogeneous exposure of cash flows to TFP shocks. That's already suggested, but this is a direct look at the exposure to the long-term growth. And uh, what we see here is that um, if you sort stocks on the, their profitability and then you look at the differences in exposures to these aggregate variables, high profitability stocks versus low profitability stocks, they have uh, different exposures to things like long-term TFP growth, long-term consumption of uh, durables uh, and uh, non-durables. So that gives us reasons to think that this kind of risk heterogeneity coming from cash flows would eventually show up in expected returns to the extent that these long-term growth shocks are priced by investors. Now, let me quickly outline a dynamic model where we can do a bit more. Now, so far, when we think about empirical evidence in relation to our simple static model, we are focused on the qualitative implications of the model. Uh, it's not obvious that um, quantitatively, we're getting a consistent picture. So what we want to do is uh, have a model that is dynamic in nature that we can uh, calibrate, and then we can ask to what extent things like value premium, 
profitability premium that we see in the data can be reconciled within the same model in terms of their magnitudes. I'm going to move through this relatively quickly. Uh, this is still work in progress, but uh, basically we're building now a dynamic model uh, which incorporates additional types of shocks. These are investment-specific technological shocks. These shocks are going to be primarily responsible for driving the value premium in the model, making it distinct from the profitability premium, which has to do with the exposure to the aggregate profitability shocks, not to the investment-specific technological shocks. We have three types of shocks in this model. We have investment-specific technology, aggregate shock. We have a permanent profitability shock and a transient one. So we're adding two more shocks relative to the static model that we have seen, and that's going to give us two different factors in the cross-section of firms, a value factor and profitability. So if you look at the first equation, it looks kind of similar to the one we've seen before. This equation now describes uh, the production function of a single productive project, and the firms are going to accumulate many of these projects. Each project uses a single unit of capital, Right? So that's now capital input normalized to one. It uses intermediate inputs, E, that firm optimizes in a myopic manner. They optimize period by period. And uh, these are our shocks. Y is the permanent profitability shock common to all the firms. X is the transient shock common to all the firms. Z is the idiosyncratic shock we saw before in our static model uh, that is firm specific. And uh, now we're adding investment specific shocks. We are saying that Firms differ in the cross-section, not only in terms of their idiosyncratic profitability, but also in their growth opportunities. And firms are going to grow at different rates. So the capital accumulation, the accumulation of projects, is going to be subject to two types of investment-specific shocks. S is economy-wide. A is firm-specific. The reason for these assumptions is that now, when we're looking at the cross-section of firms, firms are going to differ in how rich they are in growth opportunities, among other things. That's going to be driven by heterogeneity in this A shock, firm-specific investment shock. And when you sort firms on things like market-to-book ratio, you're going to generate heterogeneity in the exposures to the aggregate investment-specific shock, which is going to be driving primarily the value factor. So these two factors, the value factor and the profitability factor, they will be loading primarily on two different kinds of shocks. Value is going to be about exposure to investment-specific shocks, and um, profitability factor is going to be primarily about heterogeneous exposure to profitability at the aggregate level. So now, I will really fast forward. So we calibrate the model. These uh, things are relatively involved. They're not that fun to inspect. But maybe, I don't know if Jessica was going to comment on this. The calibration is still preliminary. It actually looks pretty good in terms of matching a range of moments. Uh, but uh, it's not the final version. And uh, we're actually planning on moving to estimation uh, from calibration. So now, once we calibrate the model, um, I'll just give you kind of one uh, example of the types of things that we need to think about. So one parameter in the model we need to be explicit about now is this eta parameter, elasticity of substitution between capital input and intermediate goods. What is it? How do we observe it? Uh, it turns out that within the model, there is a cross-sectional relation between uh, gross margins and uh, gross profitability at the firm level. And uh, when we look at this relation, it tells us that we can estimate the eta coefficient, the elasticity parameter from the cross-section of firms, which we do. And this allows us also to draw a conclusion about how the price of inputs loads on the profitability shock, which otherwise doesn't need to be immediately observable. So this is one example of the types of uh, analysis we have to go through to calibrate the model, right? So these parameters, they need to be estimated uh, from the data, either the data that uh, we're using or from uh, kind of commonly accepted sources of data in the literature. So now, having done all of this, we solve our model, we simulate it with 1,000 firms, 50 years of data, 100 times, and what we find is the following, that um, if you look at uh, these typical exercises where you form portfolios and profitability, you adjust for the market risk, you look for the alpha, we see that uh, more profitable firms not only have uh, higher returns, but uh, on a market-adjusted basis, if you adjust for the CAPM uh, model, they uh, seem to be more uh, profitable, alpha is positive, and you could adjust for, say, an HML factor, the value factor, and uh, then they become even more profitable because profitability factor, value factor are 
negatively correlated. So this is uh, telling us that the model does quantitatively capture the simultaneous properties of the value factor, growth factor, and the relationship between them. So that makes it um, quantitatively plausible and not uh, only capturing the qualitative uh, implications. And the, the last row here that uh, we're looking at, it kind of tells you that there is a connection between the two factors that uh, when you sort firms on um, profitability, you're picking up exposure to value. So when you hedge it out, that can boost the alpha as a result. And uh, if we create a value factor in the model, we also find that uh, controlling for the market exposures, value factor does have abnormal returns because market uh, model, CAPM model, is not the right pricing model in this setting with multiple aggregate shocks. So to conclude, and I'm over time now, uh, to conclude, uh, the main thrust of argument is that variable costs are quite important in determining fundamental risk of cash flows. That's the takeaway. They create an economically sizable amount of heterogeneity across the firms in terms of their fundamental risk. That fundamental heterogeneity happens to line up with the level of profitability. Uh, and uh, that's why sorting on um, uh, profitability metrics can generate a factor in the cross-section of uh, returns. It's a factor in cash flows, really, but it shows up in returns as well. And there are many things one can do going forward that are more or less loosely connected to this idea. Um, this model that we develop is a partial equilibrium model, so there are many things that are really endogenous, but we treat them as if, as if they're exogenous. For example, price of inputs. It would be nice to endogenize how that relates to, to aggregate shocks. We don't think about market power firms and how that affects the properties of the cash flows. And another direction that would be interesting is to explicitly think about the input-output uh, matrix, or the network, rather, and uh, how the position of the firm within that network affects the risk of cash flows. Thank you so much for inviting me to this conference and to uh, discuss Leonid's paper. OK, so I'm going to start my discussion with a, just a description of the um, anomaly itself, oh, green arrow, there we go. Um, so what's the profitability anomaly? Um, so let me first say that what I like about the profitability anomaly um, is it's, it's this is like the a connoisseur's anomaly, because it's not immediately obvious why it should be an anomaly. OK, so what do I mean? So gross profitability, well, revenue minus um, cost of goods sold. Um, well, we don't want to sort firms based on that because we're just going to be picking up the largest firms. So we divide by total assets, and that's the gross profitability measure that's um, typically used. OK. So what's the anomaly? Well, you take all the publicly traded firms, you sort them based on this measure. Um, the, so you form portfolios to get rid of idiosyncratic risk to get more uh, statistical power. The portfolio one's going to be the lowest profitability firm. Por firms, portfolio high will be the highest. And then you look at their subsequent expected returns. So there's a bunch of papers earlier today about this methodology. Um, so the lowest firms have about a 5% return. The highest firms have um, an 8.5% return. These are annualized. So we see a difference of about you know, roughly 4%. Um, so that's just the raw return difference. If we look relative to, say, the Fama French three-factor model, it goes up considerably to 6.5%. Um, and this finding was reported in 2013. Um, I remember discussing the original paper. In fact, um, it's you know, sort of a superstar academic paper. Um, OK, so why is this a puzzle? Um, because let's just look for a second at the definition of returns. So let's say PT is the price today, PT plus one is the price like one month from now, DT plus one is the dividend and the intermediate time. What I've put up there is the standard definition of returns. It's the dividend yield plus the price appreciation. Well, you might think at first glance that gross profitability would have something to do with returns. Because where do dividends come from if not from profits? And in fact, the dividend yield looks a little bit like gross profitability. You know, dividends come from profits, and you know, the price is related. It's you know, a market measure instead of a book measure. Um, and in fact, you know, return on equity, which is often a, used for profitability, has return in it. 
So the first thing you might think of is, well, returns. That sounds like it should include profits. And so why is it a puzzle that high return firms uh, should be the ones that have high profitability? I mean, that doesn't sound like a puzzle. That sounds just about right. Well, perhaps many of you know the answer right off the top of your head. But um, I mean, I think the answer has a lot to do with um, uh, you know, the ascendancy of efficient markets, right? So here's why it's a puzzle. It's a puzzle because the benchmark theory is a theory of efficient markets. So I will illustrate with the Gordon growth model, but you can pick any efficient markets model. So in the Gordon growth model, there's a, there's a constant growth rate of dividends and there's a discount rate. Um, and then you've got a stream of cash flows, dividends, um, and you price them as um, a standard growing perpetuity. Now, let's see what the Gordon growth model has to say about the stock return, dividend yield plus stock price appreciation. Well, we take the expectation, um, and we get the expected dividend yield plus, well, price appreciation, the Gordon growth model, expected price appreciation is just going to be dividend growth, that's G. And lo and behold, it all cancels out, and you just get R. Um, which is good, right? Because R was originally, actually, if you think about it, not just the discount rate, but the expected return. Okay, so what that means is that R really doesn't have anything to do with profitability. And why is that? Because according to the efficient markets hypothesis, which is built into the Gordon growth model, the price perfectly incorporates the expectation of next, um, next month's dividend. And so in that formula for the dividend yield, anything that's changing ET of DT plus one is going to be perfectly canceled out by PT. And so that's why our, you know, the standard intuition of somebody who just knows the terms, but you know, maybe doesn't have a degree in finance, but that's why the standard intuition doesn't work, or why at least for some people this is a puzzle. So it's, it's you know, as I say, this is why this is the kind of a connoisseur's puzzle, because many people say, wait, no puzzle. This is just what you would think. Well, no, not if your benchmark theory is the efficient markets hypothesis. OK, so now I'm going to outline in broad terms what this paper's explanation is. So this paper is, a, is within the efficient markets hypothesis, of course. So under the efficient markets hypothesis, anything that's going to move around R is going to have to be about risk. So um, in a very broad sense, this paper is coming from an arbitrage pricing theory framework. Now, it's a great deal more sophisticated than that, not that APT is not in itself sophisticated, but it builds on that in a, in a neat way. Um, so there's, a, there's some risk factors. And what this paper does is it has a model from the firm about a model of the firm from very first principles that derives betas in an APT type framework. So here we don't have to assume the betas; we can derive them from first principles. Um, the factors we we do assume to be profitability. That's like a macro factor, and then we derive the portfolio. That's like the perfect hedge for that macro factor. Okay, so that's so so this paper. Um, you know, derives where these risks are coming from. Um, and so I'll just, um, Lena did a great job of exp explaining this, so I'm just going to devote one slide to it. Uh, the, the intuition in is pretty neat here. Um, so the firm has physical capital, and it also has intermediate inputs, and it can switch back and forth between them. But it doesn't, can't switch too much because it's got this eta to worry about. Now, what, what is this eta? Well, the point is if, if well, you can see in this formula, if eta is enormous, then that equation becomes linear and it can switch all it's, it wants. If eta is tiny, then it ha if it's going to have a lot of k, it had better have a lot of e also. Otherwise, it's just not going to work. So think of eta as tiny. Um, and then there's a shock to intermediate input prices. And the thing is, firms with high z, those are the profit profitable firms. For them, it's going to be relatively costly to switch between the E and the K. Whereas the firms for which E is low, you can switch between, I mean, for which Z is low, you can switch between the E and the K, and it's not that costly. And that's the hedge. So for some firms, you'll be able to switch between the E and the K because Z is sort of a low number. And for others, you, um, you won't. And it's the profitable firms that you won't. Um, so that's the intuition in a nutshell. 
Okay, so let me just say that I thought this was very nice. And what's even nicer is that the paper has supportive evidence, which Leonid presented, about why you would think that this is true based on actually what happens with profitability and firm level numbers. So I thought it was convincing. My job as a discussant, of course, is to, prevent, to present a potentially alternative story and why you might want to think about an alternative story. So in that spirit, here we go. Um, okay. So if I were to think why we might not think that this was at least all of what was going on, well, this would be the argument. So if you look at the betas of these portfolios, not with respect to these aggregate like profitability shocks, but with respect to the market itself, they follow an interesting pattern. For the firms that are not very profitable, the betas are pretty low. Now, keep in mind these are portfolios. So you've gotten rid of all of the idiosyncratic risk. These betas are going to be pretty close to one. So for the low profitability firms, the betas are 0.92. For the middle profitability firms, the betas are actually above one. Well, that's good. That's consistent with the, with the paper story that the more profitable firms the more risky the firms are. However, if you look at the highest profitability firms, the beta goes back down to 0.94. And that difference between the middle and the highest is actually driving a fair bit of the effect. So what we see is that actually, according to market betas, these profitability, these, these high profitability firms are not all that risky. And what you also see, you can also see the same pattern in standard deviations. Now you might say, wait a second, this is an APT model, it's not a market model, so we don't necessarily care about betas. But this is a very tightly disciplined model, actually. And what, what happens in these tightly disciplined models is if there's a risk that matters enough in the economy to carry risk prices, it tends to sort of appear in everything. So in Leonid's slides, as he, slow, as he showed, the betas did not look like this. In fact, they were monotonic with respect to the market because the high profitability firms are the ones that are the, risk, are the riskiest firms. Um, so so that's, that's, I think, a, a um, that would be sort of a question what one might have about this risk story. Okay. So let me throw out some alternative explanations. And there's really only three possibilities. One is that the betas are wrong. What I just said about the betas is wrong. Betas are mismeasured. Another is that the efficient markets hypothesis is wrong. Um, another is that the result is spurious. Um, so uh, these have gotten some attention earlier today, at least the second two. OK, so um, Leonid, I know you in particular will well, like this story that I'm about to tell, not really. Leanne and I and I have talked about this before, but anyway. Um, so, so why? So betas could they be wrong? On the face of it, 0.94 and one don't sound that different. However, the thing to keep in mind about betas, unlike expected returns, is that betas are measured with enormous precision. So if you look at the t-stats on the betas, they're really, really high. Betas are measured with enormous precision as long as your null hypothesis is something like the fact that returns are normally distributed. Then you can get the betas. Now, that's the operating null hypothesis in this model. However, if returns are not normally distributed, if they have fat tails, that's when you have to worry about mismeasurement of betas because the beta, the covariance of the asset class in bad times could look very different. I don't know if this is going on in profitability. It seems like something that one might want to look at if perhaps prof high profitability firms do especially badly in times of market stress, if those market betas go up, then that would be supportive evidence of this paper's um, uh, finding. OK, so that's alternative explanation one. Alternative explanation two, efficient markets hypothesis failure. This is not as crazy as it sounds. So what you need in, for this type of failure is, I would argue, a little bit of investor underreaction, which, by the way, we might already need to explain the momentum effect, which is another anomaly that we don't really know, you know why it occurs. OK, so suppose some firms receive a positive shock to profitability. Um, now, for these firms, that shock means that that shock is kind of permanent in a sense, not permanent, but if they're profitable today, they're going to be profitable tomorrow. So profitability is persistent. 
but investors don't know how persistent it is. And so that, what that means is they see a shock to profitability, but they think it's a temporary shock, and so they underreact to it. And so then when the next month comes around, they see another shock. To them it's a shock, but in fact it was predictable, and that's when you see the highest, higher return. So in other words, the story, the naive story that I just wrote down, that I wrote down at the beginning where the price doesn't fully adjust, maybe there's something to that story after all. And you don't need a lot of investor irrationality for this to work, you just need investors to underestimate the persistence of profitability shocks, it's actually really hard to get this persistence right. Um, so, so I don't think that's, um, I think that, that's something plausible here. Um, Closely related to that would be the idea is, well, maybe they didn't underestimate the persistence at all. Maybe we've just seen a sample where that persistence is spuriously high, and thus we have an spurious anom anomaly. Now, here's why you might want to, um, to consider that. Now I'm being maybe a little bit, like, extra not nice, um, but... You know, this is maybe, you know, I don't, I don't mean to be mean here, but profitability barely clears the hurdle for statistical significance relative to the CAPM. Um, so, um, I mean, I remember this when this paper first, first came out. Um, uh, not that anybody listened to me then, because the paper now has a thousand citations, but anyway. Okay, so um, it barely clears the hurdle for statistical significance relative to the CAPM. Um, I would argue that the CAPM is the rel relevant model here. Um, so when I say barely clears, that the t-statistic the t statistic is two. Usually for this type of work, we want a t-statistic closer to four. Um, I will also say that just in the sheer amount of the anomaly relative to the CAPM, it's not that high. It's about half the value premium. It's small compared to momentum. Um, and it actually, um, consistent with some of the discussion earlier. It's actually been significantly reduced since 2014 uh, when the, with the numbers in this paper. Okay, so what I, what I mean here is um, the s significance is not that high relative to the CAPM. Had that been the end of the story, this paper would not have received the attention it did. The reason, by this paper, I mean the original profitability paper. Um, the reason it did receive the attention was the, was the alpha relative to the Fama French three-factor model. And we don't, so what we learn in a sense from profitability is we learn very precise information that the Fama French three-factor model is wrong. But the problem is we never knew why it should be right in the first place. So the CAPM, we have a theory. The Fama French three-factor model is a statistical model um, that works okay. And here we see that, well, in fact, it doesn't work that well. So one thing you might want to think about is, well, let's say value was slightly spurious, leading the Fama French model to look better than it did. What will happen is that then this profitability comes and kind of corrects for it. So if, say, the book-to-market the book to market uh, factor isn't a real factor, then you need some other factor to correct it, and that's what profitability is doing here. So I would argue that kind of one explanation here is that we're, we're sort of correcting for the ills of the three-factor model. So it's important to know that that's, that's part of this, um, what's happening with, with uh, profitability. So in terms of the spuriness, I'll just mention um, researchers advance their careers by publishing articles in scientific journals, and to be published, the result has to be novel, and you look around for fresh results. So this, uh, this idea that um, if you look after publication and the um, result goes away, it, well, it could be because of you know, people taking advantage of it. It could be because it, at that particular moment in time, the researchers found the best, the very best thing to look at, the thing that gave you the highest returns. Well, such a strategy for publishing is almost certainly going to deliver spurious results. And that could be the case with profitability. At least the result relative to the CAPM, the result relative to the three-factor model clears the, clears the significance hurdle, but I would argue that that's a little bit less interesting. So to conclude, profitability is an interesting and subtle anomaly. You need to understand quite a bit of finance to even know that it's an anomaly. This paper, just to keep a sense of perspective despite my comments, does offer an explanation that has outside supporting evidence. So I would say that this paper probably does explain a good part of the anomaly. Um, now, because this is a risk-based paper, it's based on the efficient markets 
hypothesis. It's based on the risk that firms take, take in production. Um, I think that we, it probably is not going to account for all of the anomaly because of the, you know, what I mentioned about the betas. Um, there's alternative explanations you probably want to consider. And just as a practical consequence, one thing to keep in mind about profitability is it's really most interesting if the three-factor model is already interesting to you in the first place. Then, you know, if, if like there's a value strategy, this would be a good hedge. Other than that, it's not clear that it's really the first order anomaly you would want to see. Let's let Leonid respond, and then we'll open it up to questions, and I see our runners are ready. So, Leonid? Thank you very much for discussing the paper. It was uh, evolving in real time, so Jessica was very pa uh, patient. Uh, it's not a finished product yet. Um, now, I just want to address a couple of points. This uh, flatness of market betas, uh, they actually flattened the model as well. So, this is not uh, damning evidence. In the model, the spread of market betas between high profitability and low profitability firms is basically absent. It's a to, um, 2%. It's, the beta is from 0.99 to 101. So it's, essentially it's flat. Because it, it is a multi-factor world. So the market beta is really not a proxy. And it, it, uh, the model does deliver this result that um, uh, loading some various factors are different, but the loading in the market is very similar for these firms. Now, uh, is profitability anomaly or not? We didn't pick it because of the TSTAT and uh, kind of based on my prior background and whatnot. Uh, APT, it's a nice reference because Steve Ross was one of my advisors. So my prior was strongly that uh, all these things are not anomalous until proven otherwise. That's the prior. If um, we're happy to think that this is not an anomaly, I'm fine with that because uh, the way we approach it is as if it's not an anomaly. It's as if it's basically just a pattern in returns that highlights uh, perhaps that we're missing some risk factors in a benchmark model. Um, Couple more things. One is that at the end of the day, the real important thing in uh, our view for what we do is, it's not really about the profitability premium per se, it's a natural application of what we do, but it's really about the fact that when you think about what determines the risk of cash flows, we want to highlight that understanding the variability of costs is very important because it's a big item and it's very variable. And the immediate application is that the, it creates heterogeneity along the profitability dimension, but this logic is gonna be relevant for other purposes. So that's kind of the hope to highlight this mechanism. And uh, lastly, we don't need to believe the Farmer French model. Obviously, it's not a complete model and uh, it's fairly ad hoc. Uh, but uh, if we take numbers at face value, the fact that profitability premium and the value premium have this correlation, negative correlation pattern, and both have a positive premium, if it's not spurious, then former French model doesn't need to be complete for this to be kind of interesting, because then when you combine the two, you just end up with a higher sharp ratio. But could it be a property of the sample we're looking at? That is possible. So again, the patterns in cash flows, they go beyond this kind of investor underreaction to news or uh, tea hacking kind of thing. They are fairly strong. They make economic sense. To what extent this is all there is to profitability premium, or there is more to it that's truly anomalous. We're a little bit agnostic about that piece. Yeah, I just have a quick question about your assumption about normality. How do you assume normality when, um, you know, in, in case for you know when you consider survivorship bias and uh, um, in case of market crash? Normality is a nuisance assumption here, in a sense that there is nothing in the logic of the argument that requires normality or hinges on it. Essentially, we're just assuming it because we don't uh, want to worry about distributional assumptions. It's a natural thing to assume, but uh, if you want to keep refining that uh, assumption, that's fine. By the way, at uh, finite horizons, if you're thinking about uh, our model as a high frequency description, once you take horizons to be a year or more, distributions will not look normal any longer. They're going to develop various properties endogenously. But again, this is not central to the argument. We don't need to impose normality. We can relax that easily. I have a kind of a remedial question. Um, so if, if you buy a gross profitability portfolio, your model says you're loading up on what kind of risk? Um, I saw that you have a three shocks there. Which of those shocks, is there a particular shock that you're loading up on? You're going to load more on the profitability shock. Of course, you're going to load on all of them. It's just that the real degree of heterogeneity you're going to see is going to be in the loading on the transient profitability shock. 
So there's a like an aggregate productivity shock that 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 is fun. I, I'm not going as far as saying that it's all about productivity. It could be other stuff, right? You could imagine that there are some demand side shocks, like uncertainty rising, that eventually translate into things like output moving around because of uh, various aggregation uh, phenomena. So it doesn't need to be truly productivity shock, but it's an aggregate shock that affects a common component of profitability. Yeah. So the model, just to, if this is working, it's a, um, if I could mm -hmm. add, it's a stochastic discount, exogenous stochastic discount factor model, and that's where the productivity comes from. Um, I understand the efficiency gains from building the model around a CES production function. Um, but to rebound off the first question and to perhaps circumvent some of those, um, some, some of the nuisance or noise that may come from the assumption of normality, couldn't you have tried to non-parameterize some of the model to see how that would fit in replication and simulation or even semi-parameterize what it was not the characteristic um, ADA-driven CES? Well, I'm not quite sure what you mean by semi-parameterize, but um, the reality of it uh, is that in the simple static model, it doesn't matter what the distribution of shocks is because the firm optimizes basically uh, uh, as a function of um, uh, the aggregate shock and idiosyncratic shock. So they see the realization and they optimize. So basically, it's not that important what the distributions are. But otherwise, if you relax this assumption, you could. Essentially, at the end of the day, what matters are some of the underlying properties of the model that are more general than this function of form. So the way we wrote down the model is not because we necessarily believe that this is the right description of the production function. Of course, it's not. Uh, it's uh, basically an explicit illustration of the mechanism, but one could uh, obtain it in a variety of models. It doesn't need to be a CAS function. right? Okay, uh, Leonid and Jessica, thank you so much for your presentation discussion. Thank you.